What do businesses need to be doing in 2016 to keep up to date with the latest in SEO best practice? And what should good content marketing strategy involve over the coming year? Welcome to This Week in Organic, episode number 30. This Week's in Organic, live from London on thisweekinorganic.com. Nearly forgot my bumper sound there. Broadcasting live on Blab, you're watching This Week in Organic, the weekly show that debates the ramifications of the latest SEO and content marketing news. Sign up to watch the next show live at thisweekinorganic.com. Hello and welcome. I'm David Bain, and each week I'll be joined by some knowledgeable, opinionated folks to discuss the latest happenings in anything that impacts organic traffic. And as for you in the live audience, get involved too. So click on the Tell Little Bird button if you can, the Facebook button. Um, if you want, you can even participate with us by clicking in the Call In button. I'd be good to hear from you if you fancy adding something in terms of value to what we're talking about here uh, in SEO. Um, so today we're actually going to be talking about the predictions of our 31 um, SEO content marketing experts shared with us uh, during our Christmas special show. And um, we're going to be delving a bit more deeply into that and actually looking into how those predictions impact businesses in 2016. So really a, an action orientated show rather than actually just going on the surface and just looking at uh, individual predictions. Um, so hopefully joining us later on today uh, will be James Loomstein, but uh, here at the moment is Andrew Steele. Andrew, good to have you on board. Yeah, great to be here again, David, um, and looking forward to, to talking about the, the various topics um, in a wee bit more detail, and like you said, uh, a bit more kind of action-orientated um, in this one too, so it'll be good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's really easy, you know, as, as technical kind of people to get lost in kind of, um, oh, this is how this works, as opposed to this is how to apply this to your business. Uh, yeah. I mean, do you, do you, are you involved in quite a bit of face-to-face -face client discussions yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, as, as head of SEO at Equator, um, I, I'm involved um, directly um, with a, a number of our clients, uh, pretty much all of our, our clients from an SEO um, standpoint in, in terms of at least, uh, you know, a, a kind of quarterly interaction, but often, you know, monthly face-to-face -face interaction. And a lot of that will be around kind of strategic planning of activity and, you know, making sure that what we propose and, you know, what we're looking to to implement and achieve from an SEO standpoint very much aligns with you know what the, the, our clients and, and their businesses and their business aims and objectives are as well so yeah definitely hands-on in that sense. And you find it difficult to stop yourself um, from being too technical in front of some clients? Um, it's, it's definitely a challenge I'd like to think that I've got to a point now where I, I, I'm always good at kind of reining that in but um, you know sometimes it's a challenge it depends ultimately on you know the the, the topics you're, you're covering and, and the specifics of those and you know how i guess technically minded the the clients are themselves and, and you know how how interested they are in the specifics of it so um there's always variation and again it's something that you know happily can kind of switch on or, or switch off in terms of the detail needing to go to so yeah it's a skill to do that though because i'm i'm not you see <laughs> the cartoons of the first um seo exec who's really passionate about what they're doing going to a client meeting for the first time and then just um 10 minutes of gobbledygook and then uh, their manager going okay that's the first and last time we're going to put you in front of a client yeah, yeah always watching out for the the old uh, eyes glazing over and attention wandering for sure so um but yeah you know i think like i said it really depends on on the clients and, and the, the people themselves as well but um you know sometimes people do you know genuinely want to know the kind of very specific um nature of you know, things like technical seo in particular is the kind of thing that can either you know someone can be really interested in and, and really you know um keyed into or they can just switch off entirely in which case they, you know they don't need to know the detail they just know need to know that you're on it and you're an expert in it and that, you know you're looking at these things so yes yeah, like so, i, mean, I mean, think it's a, a bit of a skill uh, have you got some like prepared answers in front of you if, if, if you're in front of a client that um, maybe is good at digital marketing in general but uh, hasn't much of a clue about SEO and um, starts to ask you questions like you know why why should I really be bothered about SEO it's not that important is it what can and you have to explain the, the, the basics of why it's important I mean what would you emphasize in that scenario 
Yeah, I think um, in that scenario, again, I guess it, it really depends on, on the industry that the client's in. But for, for all businesses, really, you know, there's a, a value to being present within organic search online because there is, you know, such a huge user base. You know, people will turn to search as a first port of call to find, you know, pretty much anything. And that's pretty evident by the volume and variety of content that, that is available online. And, you know, it'd be remiss, I guess, of any business looking to, to maximise what they, they can drive from marketing channels to, to neglect that, um, you know, in terms of a, a specific level, like I said, it, it depends very much on the client and the type of the industry that they're in. But I think it's always important to be emphasizing that organic search offers, you know, in our experience, the, the best return and, you know, um, volume and value um, of, of customers often, um, you know, across pretty much every sector that, that we deal with as well. So, you know, it's, it, I don't think it's something that's particularly challenging um, to to kind of relate to um, any any clients. And I think, to be fair, most of them do tend to come with a, a mindset that they can see the value of it. But the challenge sometimes is they've maybe become a bit jaded with it or, you know, they've they've done it before with, with someone. And, you know, they've, like we were talking about at the start, um, they've had a bad experience because of, you know, the kind of negative perception that's maybe been built of SEO because of things like, you know, kind of spammy link building practices and people who've either promised too much and under delivered or, you know, they've, they've just, you know, they've, they've attempted to have a client that's uninformed and doesn't understand what it is they're doing and just spending their money with no tangible, visible return for it. So those are, those tend to be more of the, the kind of challenges, I guess, that we'd face with a, a client than, you know, someone that just doesn't really understand or doesn't see the value in, in doing SEO or, or you know, organic search. Okay, so it's more a case of um, in 2016, people know how important SEO is. However, they've only got limited budget, so perhaps um, they've got to be persuaded, you know, whether to invest their few thousand pounds a month in SEO or in some kind of paid activity instead. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I think because as SEO continues to develop and, you know, like we were saying before, um, I think before we started recording, we were talking about how, um, you know, it's kind of crossing into a number of other disciplines in, in terms of, you know, a lot more into the kind of development or design side of things in terms of user experience and interaction, all these kind of areas that people, you know, it's quite blurred and it's not as simple a picture for them anymore to say I'm spending my money on SEO and I get this and it you will know, generate this return because it crosses over into generating more value from things like content which in its own right is often quite a hard sell to people because most businesses have a marketing budget and they're looking to spend that for and have an idea of the return that that will drive and you know with some elements of content and you know even some elements of seo increasingly it's harder to you know be accurate in a prediction of what that might be but you can estimate you know a rough size or value from that work um, and you know many times it can be you know you can drive a, a lot more business but you know there are occasions as well where things just don't pan out and you have to remain I guess quite agile in your approach to ensure that you, you know you're not just continuing with a dead duck um, kind of situation and that you're able to, to kind of respond and react and you know develop your efforts into to something else that is likely to, to generate ultimately a business return because you know pretty much all clients will spend money on SEO with a view to driving more business in you know, whatever type of their business it is so whether it's driving more inquiries or sales or bookings or you know sign ups or, or things like that so. yeah I mean going back to our um, Christmas prediction show uh, Adam Vowles, he actually said Google will continue trying to wipe out organic search in 2016. And um, that kind of relates to what you're saying there and that um, you've got so many, such, such a mix of different um, potential sources of traffic that you can focus on. And now you've got probably organic and paid um, mixing together and um, being quite confused um, to the general person actually viewing the results as in, you know, what is what, you know, it's not quite so clear now what is an organic result and what, what is a paid result. Um, I mean, do you find yourself working more closely with paid search nowadays? Absolutely. Um, you know, at Equator, we, we work in a very integrated fashion across all of our marketing channels. You know, we, we all sit together as a team and, you know, we catch up regularly as a team, but also just by proximity, we're always kind of sharing ideas and, and insights as well. So, you know, there's definite crossover with paid in terms of ad, um, paid advertising, but also, you know, in terms of affiliate activities, you know, from a simple um, kind of link building perspective, there's a, a lot of crossover 
Um, and I guess in the past, potentially you could even see it as cannibalization of, of kind of link building by affiliates type work. But, you know, I guess there's always a way of being able to view that as something that there's a, a door to kind of opening relationships with sites and creating opportunities as well from an SEO perspective. Um, and, you know, even into display, um, you know, if you look at things like Google's accelerated um, mobile pages and things like that, you know, there's obviously in there to, to be streamlining and speeding up um, kind of page load on sites. And, you know, a big part of that is is making sure that all of the kind of surrounding um, elements that, you know, wrap around the, the content that someone's actually trying to view on a page. So if you think of publisher sites, a lot of that will be advertising. It's about making sure that, you know, we're, Kind of keeping abreast of that and you know we're able to to be suggesting things that could be done to to improve the load times of you know things like display advertising to ensure that you know content loads quicker and ultimately we know that um you know that the that, that speed um, and page load time is a, a you know has been a ranking metric for some time but you know it's, it's there's always kind of crossover in that kind of integrated fashion that uh, you know at equator that's very much something that's at the heart of how we try to approach all marketing campaigns and you know over and above that um, I guess because we, you know, we, with clients, we're, you know, we are working in a, a kind of integrated fashion across a number of channels. We want to be viewing it more as what activities are likely to drive the best return for that client, um, and that might not necessarily always be, you know, primarily just SEO. But there's, there's always a, a kind of crossover, and it's it's important to be viewing it as part of the whole mix, really. So do you think in 2016 it's actually going to be less likely that businesses can? do very well by just focusing on organic on seo and content marketing um you know or is it going to be absolutely necessary moving forward into the future to invest in paid advertising at the same time um i think it's always important to invest in, in paid advertising and again you know it will, it will vary as to why or how um depending on on the landscape that, that a business is operating in but you know it's always important to be you know there's the classic ones of kind of protecting your brand space and and you know occupying in, in, in the presence with competition and, and things like that and um, you know we find that that ppc advertising can be a great way as well to be kind of more reactive in promoting things like offers and, and um, you know kind of more incentive um, driven elements that are likely to drive conversion um, I don't know that it's it's a total prerequisite for success certainly you know in terms of organic but I think for any business I don't think you ever want to become so reliant or dependent on one channel as your your driver because you know there's always a risk in that and businesses I'm sure there's plenty who have been solely reliant on organic in the past who you know they've maybe come across you know some sort of penalties or drops or whatever and it's had a serious impact in, on their businesses that they've had to then start looking at other channels to, to fill it up and equally you know we've worked um, with with some new clients um, in in the past year who you know when they've approached us their businesses have been reliant to you know the tune of 80 to 90 percent on things like aggregators to to drive their business which again you know that that's hugely costly because if you think on that you know often they'll be paying twice effectively for um you know for a, a customer by by doing that so yeah i think it's important for businesses to be considering you know the full spectrum i guess of marketing channels and, and coming up with a, a strategy and approach that has all of those working in concert um, and you know aims to, to focus on the best i guess distribution or, or um, mix of those channels for whatever industry it is they operate within some people think that um google or moving into being an aggregator site themselves and in fact even being a shopping engine themselves um they certainly for certain industries offer comparison results um which are in effect paid advertising results um at the top of their search results um does this does this mean that um the comparison site industry need to be very scared in 2016 is this something that you think google will keep on doing and, and moving into every every industry possible yeah i mean there's a, a very real possibility for it and i think you know even if you look at last year a big area that, that we do a lot of work in is in the, the travel and kind of hotel sector and you know if you look at in last year they had implemented their hotel price ads um sort of set up and you know they'd they'd revised the way local search um 
looked and was presented and, and worked really um you know down from the kind of old sort of seven pack local results to now like a, a three pack one but particularly within hotel search query space the hotel price ads stuff um has become like a prominent part of that as well and that's very much you know google acting as a, an aggregator but also in many ways an aggregator of aggregators because a lot of the people that are paying to play in that space are people like booking.com or you know expedia and, and you know all the kind of traditional um otas that, that operate within the, the hotel space the online travel agent type sites um so you know there's, there's clearly a threat to to those kind of sites um from that activity and you know google also have things like their mortgage calculator um and then you know that feeding into a, a kind of almost an aggregator type engine as well and they've had you know the the, the kind of credit cards type one too so there's you know that they are playing in that kind of space um and you know as an aggregator themselves and you know by controlling so much data in the way that they do and and by having i guess so many of these aggregator type sites heavily reliant on google as a search engine to drive you know much of their business as well i, I guess that you know there's always that threat to those kind of sites that google could you know quite easily eat into them i don't know that in 2016 they'll totally replace them and um, because it's not really what google kind of pitch themselves directly as and and still in many senses they still try to feed users through to you know uh, sites in, in the kind of classic google fashion but it is something that i think you know aggregator businesses must definitely be having a kind of weary and watchful eye on for sure so we've got a few seos um watching in listening in you're offering a lot of um great information there um people like dan bagby i know uh, you're um watching in there um so um if, if anyone would like to um join in as well feel free to actually click on the the cohen button and um um if you've got any opinion with regards to what businesses need to be doing in 2016 to actually keep up with everything seo and keep ahead of their competitors it'd be great to actually hear um your opinion as well and um, one thing that um, dave naylor said in our past show um is that um businesses need to actually be aware of google's um uh, um, user in interaction actually he, he was actually saying um, Google were going to be getting a lot of their signals or more of their signals from user user interaction over, over the coming year or so um, so um, I guess SEOs would be thinking well where are Google going to be looking for those sorts of signals because maybe not every website's got Google Analytics installed and, and, and Google probably won't be using analytics for those signals because that's a should be a piece of a standalone software. So, I mean, would you put people's minds at rest, um, Andrew, and actually say, well, don't worry about actually having Google Analytics because um, Google aren't going to be using that as part of their algorithm at all? Yeah, I don't think analytics itself will be part of the algorithm, I think. And, it, you know, I, I share um, much of the, the opinion that, um, that, that Dave shared on that. And, I, you know, I, I covered, I guess, a similar um, kind of perspective myself mm. um, that, I think the kind of user interaction metrics that Google are likely to be looking at um, aren't necessarily informed or delivered through analytics. It's more the kind of thing that they'll be able to see anyway. So it'll be things like bounce back to search time and you know dwell time based on a particular result or whatever. So I guess if you take a hypothetical situation, if someone does a search and they click on the first result in, in the, the, the search results and then you know they think this doesn't really answer the question I've asked and they bounce back after like five seconds or something like that then Google will be able to see that because they know which result that person's clicked from from what query and how quickly before they, they came back to that result as well and then you know the, the, the person might go to the second result and find that that actually answers their question they spend maybe five minutes there and then you know they return to google but they do a new search then google can kind of see that and almost at that point when they see someone do a new search then they know that they've, they've probably had their question answered or that they're refining their query because google's results didn't provide them with a site that that provided the best answer there so i think it's those so kind we, of metrics Sorry, you go. I was just say, here's a question in relation to that um if a site is ranking really well for lots of different keyword phrases and some keyword phrases not perhaps directly related to their business. And for that traffic, obviously they're not delivering great user experience. Someone's actually going back to the search results um, after a few seconds and deciding it's not relevant um, for them. Is it a good idea in 2016 if you're that type of business who's, who's bringing in a lot of traffic 
um, that's not necessarily that relevant to be de-optimizing for keyword phrases as opposed to optimizing. So the traffic that you're getting, you know, stays longer and you're getting less traffic, but you're sending better signals back to Google. Yeah, I'm not sure I would say de-optimizing is such, I guess, you know, it, it depends very much. You know, if you're getting traffic and for particular queries, then I'd like to think, you know, for the most part, that there'd probably be a reason that you have some kind of content that's already optimized on there, in which case it's maybe a case of looking at how you optimize that content further and then create a journey or a user experience for someone that's still valuable in a way. But it might, you know, if, if you can't specifically offer an answer to the query, then, you, you know, you could class the optimization, I guess, as being the process of, of creating something that's, you know, a, a primer almost to whatever it is that they're looking for and then passing them on to, the you know the the places where they're most likely to find more information on their answer, and in which case those pages, rather than sacrificing that traffic coming to your site at all, you're kind of creating a resource or a guide um, type content for them to to then go on and, and find you know what it is that they're actually using for, uh, looking for. So your pages and content are still useful at least to that audience, but they might not completely answer. The question that they were looking for but you know sure there probably will be some cases as well where google ranks a site for something and, and you know they get traffic but it's completely irrelevant to what they are in which case i guess it's more just about a, a classic seo activity of kind of continuing to review your traffic and where it comes from and you know the limited kind of keyword level data that you still get and making sure that your your content is optimized and aligned with what you're actually wanting to drive people for rather than you know kind of unnecessary or, or um, irrelevant traffic to the site so if a business um has pages that they've published um that um contains information about uh, about products which they used to actually sell but maybe they don't sell anymore um what would be a better way of actually dealing with that would you um look to actually keep the urls and you know hopefully keep the existing backlinks to that page and actually write new content for that page or is, is 301ing the page to somewhere else just as effective i think in those cases i, I guess you know it will very much kind of depend on the specific site but what i would probably typically recommend would be maintaining the pages but you know updating the, the content on so if it was a product for example that no longer existed but you had a kind of new range or alternate range of, of product, then you would probably want to maintain the page that you had, say clearly on it that, that you know that, that you no longer stock the product, but then provide some a journey um, clearly for users that directs them, I guess, to that alternative product or offering you have, or you know that that, that has some kind of call to action either to potentially get them to, to sign up to alerts or you know a newsletter or whatever in case you know you it is a product that you're looking to actually um, restock or, or stock an alternate version of so that you can you know you're, you're still getting that traffic rather than just kind of sacrificing it off because redirecting 301 redirecting the page into another page of the site that's going to be less relevant is probably becoming less valuable from an SEO perspective because Google are starting to get better at understanding all right that goes to this location now but that location is no longer as relevant to this query so you probably see that your rankings for whatever query that was originally driving traffic to that product would start to, to decline um you know if that makes sense i guess it was a bit of a, a long-winded explanation but no it's, no it's 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 interesting that you also said that um 301s perhaps aren't you know the quick <laughs> bullet um uh, that they used to be yeah. And that you need to be, you know, a, a little bit more thoughtful in terms of, um, well, what type of traffic is that? And what will they be expecting when they're visiting this kind of page? And a, a lot of websites, of course, used to, maybe if they change domains, just 301 everything to the homepage. Or if they, they, they bought a new domain, just 301 everything to the homepage. And they can be a lot more strategic and, and, and more effective than that if, if they just think about it for a little bit more. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, you know, I think it, it is really about, as you say, the kind of intent and, and understanding what users arriving on your site from organic search for whatever queries they're arriving from are expecting and likely to see, um, you know, in the content on your site. And I think that's quite evident that that's kind of Google's aim for um, search as well. When you look at things like the quality rater guidelines, and, you know, there was an update to those that they released in, in November um, last year. And, you know, when you read through there, the kind of um, guidelines and advice that they're given to their, their sort of manual quality raters very much reads along those kind of lines too. And, you know, it is about 
how well does the the, the content on a, a page or a site align with you know the, the query and the intent of that query as well so yeah definitely. absolutely and um one other thing of course google are doing with their search results now is they're trying to deliver answers straight away in there as opposed to actually uh, getting traffic um, driven towards web pages um, so, I mean, do you think that the average business needs to actually think about trying to appear in answer boxes now? Or is that something that's just not so relevant for, for most businesses out there? Um, I think it's no bad thing to do because, you know, in answer boxes, you still do, for many of them, get the, the kind of source link through. Um, again, some answer boxes, I guess, could be seen as a bit frustrating for businesses because it's kind mm -hmm. of, you know, Google taking advantage of your content and then denying you the traffic or the, the potential to have any other kind of cross sell or, or any other interaction with a, a user, um, you know, that's, that's looking for that information, if you can provide that information. But, um I think kind of beyond the answer boxes in general with content, businesses should be looking to to make their content as useful and, you know, kind of detailed and, um, you know, showing their expertise as possible. Because again, you know, relating back to what's in the, the quality raters guidelines, it is about things like, you know, the EAT, the, the acronym that they use, so expertise, mm -hmm. authoritativeness and, and trustworthiness of the content. Um, and, you know, be kind of, creating your content to those uh, tenants and keeping those in mind, I think is, is important for businesses. And you know whether Google chooses to pull out some of your, your content and feature it in answer boxes or not is, you know, I guess a bit of a secondary benefit, but also a kind of secondary concern to just simply making sure that your content is, you know, complete and, and answering the question. So, you know, I, I guess a sort of specific example of that would be if you took a hotel page you know for a, a particular hotel what are the kind of queries that someone might have around you know over and above that hotel and its location well it might be things like what's the parking like for this hotel or where's the parking for this hotel and, and things like that so you know thinking around these how can i make my content more useful for you know your your audience and, and your customers ultimately um, is the, the kind of thing that i'd be recommending and then whether that gets pulled out in an answer box or not should be a bit less of a secondary concern a sense that Google are almost actually trying to actually test the boundaries and see how far they can get away with actually providing direct direct results and selling things directly within the search results. Because obviously they've had issues in the past with um, the European Union and um, um, but perhaps even um, the government in the States about um, the fact that they've essentially got a monopoly on search in many countries. And um, that's what the service provides a search functionality not an answer functionality and perhaps it does um assist people by not having to actually click on so many different things to actually get the answer that they're looking for however of course if it um does drive visitors towards more of a, a commercial orientated result um then the eu i would imagine would certainly want to look into it uh, in, in greater depth so it'll be looking It'll be interesting to see how far Google think that they should push it in terms of that. Do you do, do, do you think that, that that may happen at some point over the over the coming year? Yeah, I, I think um, I think you're absolutely bang on with that, David. And I guess it, it, it's a kind of funny one because I guess one way of looking at it would be who owns the information really that that you know Google pull through anyway because you couldn't really say that a business owns you know a a, a piece of information like a recipe or you know how to you know change a battery in a car or something like that it might feature mm -hmm. on a, a a business website but that information's you know not necessarily owned by that business so you could you know google could always argue that they pull through that kind of information because as you say it's about making google as genuinely useful for users as possible and you know a big part of their focus is kind of speeding up and um, the the the, the process and you know in which someone gets from asking their, their query to getting their answer um through google uh, the you know the, the kind of i guess the gray area with that is that the longer that people spend on a google search results page the more exposure they get to google's advertising as well so you know there's always that trade-off of you know they'll argue things one way in that we're doing this for the users and then at the same time you know advertising continues to to increase um you know i think i was reading on moz um at the beginning of the week about how advertising um, is continuing to increase in, in Google search results pages but you know there's not there's not 
a whole lot of kind of study or evidence out there to to really kind of prove that but it's just a kind of you can feel it in the organic result um the the number of listings on an organic result pages is, is quite often reducing so you know there's many cases where you'll get as, as few as kind of seven organic results on a page but then you'll get more other elements into it like i was talking about before in terms of like hotel price ads being a feature of, of local packs and then surrounded by the, the you know the, the ppc advertising things like that that it, it kind of it's understandable that google will try and push the boundaries with this because ultimately from you know a cynical Google's business point of view is they want to drive more money out of, of advertising revenues and you know the other kind of aggregator type channels that we were talking about before that they're looking at but I guess you know on the flip side they could always argue that if it's if it's good for the user and it's what people want then you know it's tough tough lines really for businesses at the end of the day no one you know no one specifically owns that information so yeah but in 2016 yeah, I, mean, I, I think it'll I think it'll be something that, that, that has the real potential to, to become more of a, an issue sure absolutely yeah i was just going to say to the general public um google search and searches google really and there's there's there's, there's nothing much um else out there I, I did read a interesting article saying that DuckDuckGo go ended uh, 2015 with 12 mil million searches per day so they're steadily increasing obviously nothing you know compared with um searches and other minor search engines even compared with google but um they do seem like an interesting alternative to some probably more techie type people um th their growth seems to be fairly exponential at the moment but um again nothing much compared with google do you think um something that may happen in 2016 is another search engine may become more prominent and if so does does that mean that um from an seo perspective you need to be more aware of you know optimizing for other search engines as opposed to google um i don't know it's a tough one to call i guess but i i don't see another search engine coming and really challenging google and um, certainly not in 2016 because i think if there was a real risk of that that's you know someone had developed a better search offering um you know i guess that would be in terms of, of algorithms I, I can't see that happening given how much and you know how large scale google have become and really dominant in in that space that you know the, the classic kind of analogy has always been if you're optimizing for best practice for google then you're probably a couple of years ahead of, of best practice for for most of the other search engines as well um but you know things like DuckDuckGo, I, I guess exactly as you said, David, that you know they have an appeal, particularly to probably more technical user, because they do stream out a lot of the things that can frustrate people who spend a lot of time, um, you know, online in, in terms of advertising. Um, I guess it, it really depends on you know how I guess we as as online marketing and advertising professionals continue to develop our you know uh, implementation of, of online advertising and making it actually genuinely well targeted and, and well aligned to users as well and you know Google have obviously released things um within the, the past year or the past couple of months to, to try and allow people to to more personalize and, and or you know better personalize or, or target particular users with a, their advertising on google certainly um but i, I you know I, I struggle to see a situation where another search engine is going to kind of really challenge um google in 2016 although i think you know it'd be very good um probably for um the, the space in us as as seos as well um but i would have thought that the kind of optimization work you would be doing for it would probably be pretty similar to what we're talking about already or if not more focused on kind of user interaction metrics because i think that's probably where search ranking algorithms are, are starting to, to go a lot more because you know the kind of classic links and and keyword optimization of, of pages and metadata and things like that are, are starting to 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 kind of be things that have been so heavily gamed in the past and can still be manipulated and gained in many ways that I would have thought that's where a, a new search engine would probably try and target its its algorithm around. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's difficult to see anytime soon another search engine coming up and um, um, adding any significant volume to, to what they're doing. But um, I guess we'll try and revisit that one maybe in a year's time and yeah, see well, if it's any different. 
who knows as well. I mean, you know, Google in the early days kind of fairly came out of nowhere. And, you know, if you think mm. how saturated, um, you know, the internet was with search engines in terms of people like Lycos and, you know, Ask Jeeves and all these oh, sort of search engines. That, and, yeah. yeah, exactly. And, you know, where are they now in, in the grand scheme of things? So, you know, who knows? But again, I think just because probably how developed that, that um, you know, internet and, and, and search has become and, you know, how large and, and you know how large scale I guess a monopoly on it um, all that Google have I, I, I do kind of struggle to see it just happening overnight and, and out to the blue but who knows <laughs> something else that um, Michael Fleischner and Lucas Zelezny said was that um, in 2016 watch out for AI artificial intelligence is going to be big and um, there were reports a few months ago that it's now the third and fourth most uh, important aspect within Google's algorithm but um because it's AI, because it's um, self-learning, it's not really any one particular element within optimization that you can focus on here. So although it's important, is there anything much that SEOs are going to be able to do in order to actually try and optimize themselves for this artificial intelligence at at all? Um, I think you could argue there is and there isn't, I suppose, because there is in the sense that the AI will really just be, I think, mainly focused around kind of analysis of of kind of large scale data that that Google will have. So it will be things like user interaction data and user interaction with search data and, you know, looking at trends as well in terms of what are the the kind of norm signals of of good quality sites in, in Google's eyes within spaces as well. So I think in terms of what you can do to optimize for things like rank brain, it probably is a bit of a continuation of the you know the, the trend that we've been going towards very much anyway in terms of you know a quality of, of link profile but also over and above that a quality of content and user experience of a site because those are the things that really we if you know if you think of how we use the internet as users rather than the marketers those are the things that people are looking for is something that answers your the questions you have does it well does it you know to a a, a very in depth and and uh, complete sense and you know does it with a, a strong um quality of experience and you know a very clear kind of user journey through it as well and you know all those things i guess are ultimately ux um kind of aims and goals and you know feed into the, the various user experience metrics that as we were talking about before are likely to be the kind of things that something like rank brain will be looking at and kind of amending and adjusting search results too i would have thought but again you know until google really kind of confirm or, or tell us otherwise that's just a, a personal assumption on that really but you know as you see ai it, it, it's just a, a learning um mechanism and it will be fed by data so it, you know I, I can only imagine that it's that kind of data that's feeding it yes yeah i mean i was thinking just now perhaps ai might be more involved with uh, predictive search and get better at um, producing results that um, it thinks that u- users are likely to be wanting. So perhaps it evolves around seasonality, um, maybe around someone's um, previous search history at a certain time of day or, or, or night. So um, maybe they're going to get better at delivering search results before someone actually searches for that item. And that could be quite an in- interesting trend. And um if that does happen, it would be um, interesting again to see whether or not users actually embrace that or, or whether or not they actually were turned off by the fact that um, um, this technology was actually suggesting things to them that yeah, perhaps they did want, but um, they consider it to be prying too much into their, their inner mind. So there's, there's that line between being comfortable with using technology and feeling that technology is is trying to take over and maybe users having a backlash against that kind of predictive search. Yeah, and you know, I think it is, you know, it's something I guess even I can remember reading articles about, you know, this kind of I guess utopian age of, of search where search would know, you know, or or Google, for example, would know what you were looking for before you you knew yourself, as you said there, David. And you know, I think um you know, there's a definite element to that probably of, of things like rank brain in terms of being able to make associations between 
um, you know, particular objects and entities um, in a similar way to, you know, what Google had said that, that Hummingbird was very um, focused around. And then also, as you say, being able to make connections based on a personalized element to, to people's search, but also, I guess, trying to trend together, um, you know, what other people are searching for that was of a similar topic to what you're looking for and kind of answered their queries well um, and, you know, almost in a thesaurus-like fashion, being able to connect that because, you know, there'll be things that people search for, like the example, I guess, before, with, I think it was released with Hummingbird was a um, movie with Tiger in a boat or something like that and, you know, it was producing a, a result that was about the, the life of Pi, but, you know, there'll be things like that where people will be asking questions of Google in a very different way and a, a almost a lazier way, I guess, that, but, you know, mm -hmm. things like Rank Brain maybe help it still provide, you know, the, the answers that people were, were meaning or looking for. But Stephanie Catcher come back on the call there. Uh, Stephanie's um, a Twio regular. So um, good to, to have you back, uh, Stephanie, there. So um, we've, we've even got a spare seat here if you fancy joining in and uh, give us, giving us your opinion in terms of um, what you think um, businesses need to be doing in 2016 to stay ahead of um, what is happening in SEO at the moment. But but one thing that really is happening in terms of search is, is we're seeing uh, an increased difference in the ty different types of search results. You know, if someone's on a, on a mobile device, if someone's in a certain location, their search results are going to be completely different. And, and that's not something that was there at all maybe four or five years ago or so. Um, so, I mean, have you got any thoughts on what businesses can be doing to um, better optimize their content for specific locations to, 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 to appear in, in a manner that, you know, is optimized as possible for, for, for that? Yeah, um, I think, um, you know, for, for businesses that are um, very location focused in terms of, you know, they have multiple locations, I guess there's elements to that that will be you know, as, as simple as using kind of a uh, schema type markup and, you know, all the, the, the kind of additional layers of data that, that you can use to that to, to clarify, you know, the, the actual physical locations and, and geographies that, that, you know, your, your um, business is specific to. Um, I think there'll be classic elements to it in terms of, uh, you know, the, the kind of classic elements of local um, search optimization in terms of things like citation building and, and all those kind of things. But increasingly as well, there's a lot of kind of technical elements to location. And, you know, if it's in if it's within one country, then that will be, you know, kind of focused around that um, additional layer of data that, that things like schema um, offer. But then when you start looking more internationally, you know, Google have got a, a lot better in terms of their offering over the last couple of years within things like Search Console or Webmaster Tools as it used to be in terms of hreflang type setup and, and being able to set up for specific geographies and how they handle things like, um, you know, CCTLDs are, are top level domains, you know, between dot coms and dot co dot UKs and dot de and things like that, and all the the myriad ways that people used to do those in terms of you know a subdomain or having a, a top level domain or a folder um, structure that that worked to that. Um, you know, Google have got a lot better at being able to understand and, and kind of interpret those many different ways and, and still be able to to relate um, that you know results tagged back to them. Um, but I think. In terms of a user specific set of results, you're right, you know, personalization um, within different geographies is, is huge and it makes it a challenge for businesses, I guess, to be ever be able to really know what a user's result sets look like and, and where they, they're positioned within that. But, you know, you, it's just a case of you have to do the things that you know that you can do that will help that. And, you know, I think a big one for geographic locations within, you know, one one country or, or region um, is very much the, the obvious place to start would be sort of schema markup. And again, Search Console has a lot of kind of um, improved tools to help people set that up fairly simply. And, you know, Google are looking at things um, to, to do with Tag Manager where you can start um, implementing a lot of uh, kind of, of tags and, and schema type markup and, and JSON and things like that to get a bit more technical um, within that as well. It makes it even easier for people to be able to add these kind of markups to their site too. So uh, I think that's that's probably the place I would recommend starting for, for local um, kind of optimization for businesses. Okay, so markup um, 
Yeah, markup started, you know, for, what about four years ago or so, and um, it seems to have um, not been talked about that much that recently, but um, it also seems to be more important than ever to mark up your content. And if you're not doing that, then, of course, Google aren't going to be that confident with regards to who specifically you are trying to target um, in terms of the type of content, the actual um, thing that you're talking about, but also location as you're talking about there as well. So very, very, very important moving forward. One other thing that um, Greg Gifford actually mentioned in the Christmas special was that um, he was saying that beacon technology will be big in 2016. So, I mean, that's about um, really, I, I, I guess, an advertiser or, or at least your device identifying almost where you are um, and um, an advertiser being able to actually deliver content very, very relevant to precisely what you're doing at that moment in time. Is that just advertising or is there any way that organic marketers will actually be able to take advantage of that, do you think? Um, it's an interesting one because beacon technology is something that we've actually been looking at quite a lot at Equator as well, um, certainly within our, our innovations team. And, you know, I, I think there's a couple of pieces of content out that we've, we've produced on that as well. Um, I think it's definitely got opportunities for advertising, um, certainly because it's, you know, it, it is something that allows a, a greater kind of personalization and, and usefulness to people dependent on their specific location so you know some of the examples that we've looked at in the past have been for things like banking or hotels so you know someone walks into their bank and you know the the, the tellers or, or the staff immediately know that they've entered and you know they, they know what the state that their account's in or you know anything where they, they need to you know they might want to advise them on or things like that it allows people to have conversations i guess in a, a more uh, kind of slicker advertising almost type fashion rather than just sending out a mail or, or, you know, an email or whatever to someone to say, how about you get a credit card? Because we've seen that, you know, you, your accounts, you, know, you, you, you run into your overdraft a lot or, or things like that. Um, it allows, you know, a, a more a more human element to kind of come into those things. But also in terms of usefulness, you know, for hotels, we've looked at things like, you know, people being able to, to check into hotels and get into their room and things like that without ever having to, to speak to someone. Um, and then, you know, like if you're walking by the restaurant or whatever, it can send you an alert to say, have you booked a table? Have you got something sorted for dinner tonight? Or, you know, it can allow people to order drinks at a bar without ever leaving their table. And, you know, the waiter just brings it over to you and, you know, all these kind of things. So, it, you know, it is it's powerful technology and, it, you know, it has some great uses as well. In terms of how it ties into organic, I don't know that there's a lot of development yet to really work with that, but you know, there's certainly there's certainly potential for it to to be able to do uh, to to tie in more to search. But I don't think that I think the barrier maybe at the moment is that people like Google and, and search engines aren't really tying into uh, that kind of specific a uh, kind of local level of of technology in terms of beacons. It's more probably advertising type focus that the opportunities are there but that's not to say that there's not you know opportunities on the cards really that that can help develop that but I guess as a secondary spin-off by being able to offer a better experience for your customers through you know the use of beacons and things like that there will always be a benefit to organic in terms of you know it helps with brand and, and conversion and and you know the, the 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 kind of metrics that kick off the back of that as well so so I haven't really looked into it as much as um, you have by the sound of it. Do you think, um, is it necessary, for instance, to actually have um, an app installed from a business in order for that business to actually use that technology? At the moment, um, my understanding of it is that, that it is. Um, and again, you know, whether that changes in the future or not, um, I, I, I couldn't really tell you. It's not my, my personal area of specialization, sure. but um, certainly, you know, uh, people like our innovations director, Martin Jordan, um, he's he's covered a, a lot on that and, and been looking a lot into this area. And, and we've been working with some clients to, to, be, uh, to begin testing opportunities um, for beacons as well, because there's opportunities for businesses both internal to their business and, and being able to utilize beacons but also you know in their, their interactions with customers as well um uh, but i think very much at the moment as i understand that it is you know quite heavily required you know to have a, an app that that kind of integrates with that but i think that the ideal 
and and what I'm pretty sure is being worked towards is that it's not going to be you know a requirement to have an app to be able to to work with beacons and the, uh, beacons rather than that, that you know it will be something that will be more um, universally um, kind of tied in I guess to to um, technology and, and kind of this really more f sort of more mobile focused technology experience. It'll be intriguing, certainly, to see how the technology moves forward. Um, so well, I reckon we've got about five minutes or so left of this discussion, so probably a last, a last opportunity if anyone else wants to jump in and say hello. We've got uh, Clint from Olympia SEO on as well. So Clint, Sam, you could uh, jump in if you have any opinion with regards to how um, businesses are going to be amending their focus with regards to SEO in 2016. But I, I think the other other topic that I wanted to actually just cover briefly was, or focus a bit more on was was UX, um, because um, you mentioned that, you know, as, as, as part of the Christmas um, predictions show yourself, and um, part of UX is, is, is delivering great personalized relevant content to users as well. But there's the challenge, of course, from an organic search perspective is, are you actually going to be able to deliver different pieces of content to different people and still be as effective in the eyes to Google? I mean, do you let Google see all the content? Um, is, the, is there only a core version of the content that you let Google see and then adapt the content after that and hide the rest of it? Uh, have you got any thoughts about that from an SEO perspective? Um, I guess do you mean in terms of a, a personalization of content versus uh you know Google's sort of historic view on on content and you know the, the potential for duplication there's that kind of what you Yeah I mean maybe, maybe if if you've established that um the person that is reading your content is more likely to be um a certain age bracket um female um maybe you've got an idea of their interests um there may be an opportunity to personalize that content based on who you think that person is to make it more relevant for them. So if, that, if, if that's the case, and, and perhaps you've got um, four or five different versions of your web page tailored at different audiences, um, what would you do? Would you maybe just have that core version of the web page of the URL that Google can actually see, but um, dynamically deliver a different version of the page and not let Google crawl it based upon who you think that person is? Yeah, I think that's probably the, the you know, historically and, and classically the, the kind of best approach to it. But I think there's kind of technology starting to catch up a lot more now to to enable um, you know businesses to be able to to kind of offer that more sort of tailored offering in a better way. So things like or platforms rather like um, Angular JS and and all these kind of if platforms are, are are starting to become a bit more prominent in in terms of the development platforms for websites and in the past you know they were a complete no-go for you know if you were wanting to be found in organic search because as we know javascript wasn't something that google could could crawl before um, or you know index and and you know all the kind of challenges that came on with that but um last year probably about this time last year actually google um, made some pretty significant strides in in terms of how they're able to interact with that and you know there's some good um, Google sort of developers support um, pages on the usage of, of um, JavaScript and platforms like AngularJS for these kind of dynamic changing content. Um, and Google, you know, there's been some testing as well. I've, I've seen the results of in, in the past sort of nine months that, that Google are able to, you know, crawl and index um, these kind of dynamic elements to, to the variety of ways. So in terms of how strongly those sort of dynamic versions of content would perform within Google's organic search results. I think it's harder to, to say for that in terms of ranking potential, but it's definitely, you know, they are moving towards, uh, uh, um, you know, a way of being able to interact with sites that, that offer that kind of um, dynamic and, and personalized content, but still, you know, around a core element to the content or a core topic covering, um, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, I think in, in terms of the classic way of being able to, to deal with that, I would say it's, it's probably about having a, a core page that's your comprehensive view of the content and then tailored pages off of that that you may want to kind of canonicalize to the, the core um, relevant version of the page. Um, so that you know in google's eyes you're, you're clearly saying to look this is my my master version of the page if you like but these others sit off of it as a a more flavored view 
Okay, so as long as if it's um, content that's just um, edited a little bit for um, different um, buyer personas, then um, you say it's say it's five or ten percent altered, then it's fine to canonicalize that to the core version. How, how, how different can a piece of content be before canonicalization isn't the the, the, the most appropriate approach um, for doing that? Um, I think it's always a tough one to measure because I guess there's no hard and fast kind of percentage different of, of uh, percentage difference rather of, of the content. I think it's more of a, mm-hmm. a judgment call, I guess, then when you know the the specific um, kind of topic or tone or, or information in the content starts changing substantially from you know it, it, it's it's um, you know its original version. Then you probably want to start looking at a different way of, of being able to address that. But certainly, you know, if you're talking about more kind of flavored to a, a buyer persona then i think you know canonicalization is probably the best way of, of being able to address that and um, certainly you know the kind of hypothetical example that we're using there and um, in terms of how different again i think it really has to be a judgment call rather than trying to work off of the classic kind of percentage difference in words or content length or anything like that <laughs> judgment call used to be the um what you do in terms of actually um what percentage of links would contain a certain type of anchor <laughs> <Yeah>. text, but <laughs> that's yeah. um, SEO from a while ago. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, one piece of general advice that um, our previous show finished with was actually by um, Kelvin Newman, and he said, be agile in 2016. Um, I guess there's so much that could happen. There's so many things that, that will evolve. Um, I, I, I guess that's a piece of advice that, that you would reflect as well and actually say, look, just keep your ear to the ground and be aware of what's changing and be adaptable in the future. Absolutely. I think, you know, if you look back at the, the, even the topics we've covered today, I think there's there's no real certainties within SEO. And, you know, I think it's important and it always has been really to continue to learn and, and continue to, to be agile and be able to, to move and develop with the way that search goes and also, you know, the way the way that businesses are able to interact with it in terms of the technologies and platforms and, you know, how, how they can be utilized. So, you know, the example I've seen before there in terms of things like angular js and being able to to provide a much more dynamic um, user experience as a result of these things the fact that google are starting to catch up and be able to to kind of index and reward those types of things is, you know makes it it's always important to to be looking at both the, the platforms as well as the specific kind of seo approaches in terms of you know is it schema markup that you're needing to be adding or should you be looking at creating better user journeys and user experiences and all these kind of things? It's really, you know, absolutely. I think the best piece of advice is remaining flexible and, and fluid and agile um, in, in your approach for sure. Well, I'm sorry we couldn't get any friends to share the platform with you today, <laughs> Andrew, but uh, I had no doubt that um, you could uh, quite capably <laughs> participate in a, in a wonderful discussion um, by yourself. So, um, Thank you so much for for joining me. Would you like to remind uh, the the listeners, the watchers, um, a little bit more about you and uh, where people can find you? Sure. Um, I am Andrew Steele, the head of SEO at Equator, um, and you can find me through the Equator website, which is eqtr.com, or on Twitter at Andrew J. Steele, or through LinkedIn, um, again, Andrew Steele. um, And and, uh, yeah, hopefully um, people are find this uh, useful and interesting as always it's it's been great to be on and and uh, have some very very interesting and, and varied discussion with you david as always oh it's great um for you to uh, to join us yeah thanks for that and of course we'll um leave links to um where people can find you on the, the the replay page that'll be um um published on the analytics seo blog at, at some point um over the next week and I'm David Bain, Head of Growth at Analytics SEO, uh, the agency and enterprise SEO platform with big insights. Sign up for a free demo of our platform at analyticsseo.com. And you can also find the interviewing online marketing gurus over at digitalmarketingradio.com. Now, if you're watching this show as a recording, remember to watch the next show live. So head over to thisweekinorganic.com, sign up for the um, updates there and be part of the live audience for the next show. But um, for those of you watching live, um, we also have an audio podcast of previous shows. So. Again, sign up to email, email updates at thisweekonagaric.com and you will receive the pod la- podcast link from there as well. But until we see you again, have a fantabulous weekend and thank you all so much for joining us. So, adios and thank you again, Andrew.